Odell show, and I am beyond thrilled to have one of uh, um, someone I consider to be a an asset in my learning capabilities while I'm continuing to get fit and teach you guys as well. And so with me today is Dr. Jack Cruz. And um, Dr. Cruz, you're probably somebody that I've wanted to interview since the beginning of my podcasting career. So I just really appreciate you coming on today. And can we just jump right into to my listeners getting to know you? Can you give us a brief story about your background, what you do, and then also uh, what brought you to this point of what we're going to be talking about today is kind of like hacking into your mitochondria and really creating an optimal shape and an optimal health that has not really that much to do with nutrition. Um, so jump right in, Dr. Cruz. Uh, about... Uh Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen years ago, um, at that time, I was given a talk, a minimally invasive spine talk in Birmingham, Alabama. Got up to give the talk. Got horrible pain in my right knee. Didn't know what caused it. I was in a room full of orthopedic surgeons and their spouses. They diagnosed me on the spot as tearing my knee meniscus, and I couldn't figure out how because um, all I did was get up to give the talk. And normally, you know, from my background, my training, and neurosurgery, I was associated that you had to have some kind of trauma with that. Um, it turned out at that time, I was six to about uh, 360 pounds. So after the talk, the orthopedic surgeon's wife came up to me. She goes, look, I think I know what has happened to you. I'm going to send you a book and six papers. She gave me directions of exactly uh, what to do first, read the book first, send the papers. Long story short, she uh, used to work for a biotechnology company, she no longer does, named Amgen. Amgen at the time was uh, having synthetic leptin trials. Leptin is the hormone that's made in your hypothalamus that basically controls all types of uh, information about uh, energy and information in your body, it controls every single hormone in your body. I didn't learn anything about it in medical school. Basically what she was trying to tell me was that leptin, uh, I should say that Amgen was crooked. Uh, that's why they shelved their trials. But unfortunately, I took the message a completely different way. And when I read the book, I thought she was trying to tell me, is this book actually physically possible? <laughs> and I decided to jump down that rabbit hole. And then for 18 months, I went to the medical school library close to where I was living at the time and started to find everything else I could possibly know about this leptin thing that I had no clue about. Oh. And uh, I graduated medical school in 93, leptin was discovered in 94, so hence the reason I never learned anything about it. Um, it's the sad part is here we are in 2018 and most doctors still don't know anything about it, which is exactly what the problem in science is because it usually takes about 20 to 25 years to go from benchtop research to mm -hmm. Real realism or, or real life, what I like to call skin in the game. So uh, what happened then? Since I'm a neurosurgeon by trade, I uh, am taught to believe in the, the scientific method, which is randomized controlled clinical trials. Well, there was no way I was going to be able to do that myself. So I started to do self-experimentation on myself, which is now called mitohacks. And the first mitohack that I came up with after – those, those 18 months of study after putting everything together was something called the leptin prescription and the cold thermogenesis protocol. So as a true scientist, I said to myself, um, I didn't believe anything that I found. I told actually my family at a Thanksgiving dinner back in what, 03, 04, I think it was, um, that I think I tripped over something. It might work. I'm going to do something unusual. And we'll see what happens. And I made a prediction to my brother-in-law. Uh, I said that I would probably be wearing his jeans in a year. And he laughed. Actually, everybody laughed except my wife. And long story short, I lost 77 pounds in three months. And then when I added CT to the mix, 133 in 11 months. Mm -hmm. And I did it by eating more and exercising less. Yeah. And that was kind of how the story started and then uh, of course when this change went on in me since I was in the hospital all the doctors are like dude what happened did you have surgery this and that I'm like when did I have surgery you guys will see me every every day for the last year 
So I started talking to a gastroenterologist who was one of my good friends. And um, I told him kind of what I had found, you know, not not in, in scientific lingo, so to speak, but uh, kind of like you would talk to one of your friends who had actually a science degree since you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. And he said to me, he goes, would you mind if I started sending you some of my patients um, to see if any of this stuff would work on them? And this is obviously has nothing to do with neurosurgery, but they were, they were tough cases for him that he couldn't do. And turns out every single person he sent to me actually got better. And I had told him about other hacks that I did on my family after I did it on me. And he said, dude, you need to start putting this information on the internet. So I got the uh, bright idea from him to actually put the original quilt document that has the, what I like to call 30 different levies. And I picked the name levies because those are the things that protect the city of New Orleans from hurricanes. Yeah. So yeah. each one of the tenants that I learned about my own uh, travel from being a surgeon to a patient was um, outlined in each one of those levies. And, and they start with most important to least important. And that's actually when I wrote it, you know, back 15 years ago. Uh, I, if I had to change it, and to be honest with you, I haven't changed it in a while, but I probably should. Some of the levies now, I think are far more important than some of the other ones before. But you have to remember, when I wrote that document, it was my understanding at that time. And just like anything in science, things tend to get updated as new data come out. So about 10 years ago, when I started putting this stuff on the Internet, a lot of people would immediately call me a uh, quack, uh, pseudoscience, and this and that. And then, you know, when you put yourself out there, out of what you expect, uh, and it, it uh, obviously didn't phase me at all. But the, the best part of the story for me now, now here we are in 2018, is that every year I get less crazy and everybody thinks I'm a lot more smart because all the outlandish things that I said 10 to 12 years ago and what I said in front of some really big groups right. who try to right. ostracize me and make fun of me uh, has now turned out to be very, very true. So very all I have good. to do now when I go and give talks all over the world is just take pictures of articles and say, hey, look at that. Hey, look at that. And the thing for me, and this is part of the reason why I wrote the quilt document, is to show people that 15 years ago, the answers are actually in nature. They are there, but they're only there for people who are willing to erase what's in their head from that USB device called your education, your parents, your society, your civilization, your culture, until you make these observations yourself and then you test them yourself. See, the problem that we have in medicine is when we test uh, in a randomized controlled clinical trial, what are we getting? when we add numbers to the patients, all we're getting is a, a, a record of average. Mm -hmm. And if you understand anything about average, that's really what not, that's really not what life shoots for. Evolution is all about survival of the fist, fittest. So what does that tell you when you bring it to like a mathematics discussion and you consider what a randomized control trial is? Life is really about the tail in a bell distribution. But, and what I like to call that area is that's where bl the uh, black swan mitochondriacs live. Yeah. And the key with, with understanding that is that each one of us come with uh, our own blueprint built into our mitochondria. That really tells us a lot about the environment that we're optimized to. And the key is once you understand the basics, then what you do is you perform mitohacks to find out truly where you, you're gonna do well. The real part problem for most people these days is that uh, they don't realize that some of the unhidden things that humans have created uh, are the biggest effects on our mitochondrial biology, and that's what has caused most of the major problems today. And I think the thing that makes me the most controversial, even today, uh, on most of the podcasts and things that I do, although I very rarely talk about it anymore, um, is 
about 10 years ago, I told people at like a big paleo conference, like Paleo FX, when I was the first keynote speaker, that food wasn't important. And, you know, to say that at a food conference, um, of course, pissed a lot of people off, some of the people that were running the conference, but they weren't willing to hear this out, which I thought was kind of ironic because these people are supposed to be evolutionary directed and have an open mind. And it turns out that they were as closed minded as the world that I came from, which is allopathic medicine. And that's really that's kind of my story in a nutshell. I love that. Um, I and thank you for sharing it too, because I I think I've talked to you briefly before this, but I wanted to share with the listeners how I came across you. Uh, for those that I hadn't told this story to, but I came across you just by happenstance when I had a, a baby that was a year old, and at the time I was mostly into nutrition and exercise because that's how I started out. And like you said, we just we just start learning with what we are knowing at the moment and. So when I came across you, I realized uh, that that you helped save my daughter's life because at that time she was sleeping in her room with a Wi-Fi router right on the other side of the wall and wasn't sleeping more than 30 to 45 minutes at a time, and I couldn't figure out what the issue was. And it wasn't until I listened to you, read the EpiPaleo prescription, and found a lot of your blog articles that meant, made so much sense to me that I, I went and unplugged the router one day while she was napping, and on that day... It was the first day she slept for two hours straight. And I knew that I had something at that moment. And so that's when I dove deeper into like what you were talking about, listening to a lot of podcasts that you were on. And I knew that at some point I would need to talk to you myself because you say things and the mito hacks that you have, no one else is saying these. And yes, like you're saying now, it's starting to come around, you know, earth and ground and getting in the sun and uh, limiting your blue light, turning on your night shift and stuff like that. That's starting to come around. But you were the first person that I ever found that said these things. And so I, I just want people to, to realize that here is a neurosurgeon that you know, maybe stopped using the scalpel as much and actually went into fixing people with 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 natural things that we like you said already have the knowledge inside of us to know we've just kind of forgotten and these unhidden things that are staring us right in the face right now are the things that are causing us some of some of the biggest problems so that's kind of what i wanted to bring attention to my listeners today is they're they've got in their hand or they're looking at right now something that could be part of the whole reason they're sick or they're obese or they're having issues with their body and it has probably very little to do with nutrition. I think at one point I heard you on a podcast say that nutrition is actually one third of, of what health and, and gaining an optimal shape and optimal health is about. And the other two thirds, I'd like you to go into that a little bit more. Can you fill us in on those two thirds that you have an idea about? Yeah, well, I, I just I met one of my friends who I really argue with on, on Facebook and I uh, pointed out to him that the fastest human on earth right now is Usain Bolt. And he made a comment uh, during his last uh, gold medal performance where, you know, he, he did it again, that his training regimen was that he ate chicken McNuggets just about every day. And I made the comment that when you have good mitochondrial function, you could basically eat shit on a shingle and get away with it. Because that's what humans are designed to be. They're designed to be omnivores. They can eat anything provided the mitochondrial function is good. What's the part of the equation that's the issue for most of us today? It's actually the mitochondria. So to make it uh, make sense to the non-scientists who are listening to this, it's a very simple concept when you think about a car. Do you focus in on the fuel or do you focus in on the engine when you're trying to get Nissan Sentra to become a Ferrari? And when you think about it, mechanical way you start to go duh this is kind of pretty obvious where it gets really interesting is actually when you understand mitochondrial medicine then that's where all these enigmas paradox and mysteries begin to make sense especially the ones that keep cropping up in the nutrition and dietitian and diet world and I've, I've told people ad nauseum that every year we have 250 to 350 new diet books so if diet is the answer, why in the hell haven't we stumbled into the answer yet for the last 50 years? Well, because diets don't do anything for us. And when I say that, I get in trouble. 
Not with this nutritionist, only because like I get people into the door with nutrition, but once they're in the door, then I'm saying, okay, you have, here's your little meal plan. Let's, let's start with what's really important though. And that's what you're talking about right now is these mito hacks. Yeah, well, what really, what really, I think about food as electrons and protons and actually light rays and what most people who are non-science people, I'd say 99% of the people listening to this podcast, they think about food as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Mm -hmm. But why do you have to change your perspective to understand the mitochondria perspective? Very simple. And, and, and this is axiomatically true. This is one of those few things I'm going to tell you that Jack Cruz is 100% correct about and where dietitians and nutritions make their big mistake. All the food gurus make the mistake. The entire food web on this planet is linked to photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Photosynthesis is the control of sunlight taking CO2 and water, mixing it together, and making sugar. Here's the key. Inside of you is these mitochondria, these engines, these Ferraris. What does it do? It reverses that process. It takes sugars, fats, and all the other crap that you eat, and turns it back into CO2 and water. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you begin to understand what I just said is like a spider on a mirror doing push-ups, you begin to realize that what food really is, is an electromagnetic barcode of sunlight as the seasonal power density varies as you revolve around the sun. And your mitochondria is the cipher that deciphers that information in those electrons and in those protons. And if you don't think that's true, I want you to open up any biochemistry book and, and you tell me where it says carbohydrate, protein, or fat input. No, it's called electron chain transport and proton chemoosmosis. So the two inputs fall in my argument, not in yours. So that means that maybe everything that you've had put into that head of yours needs to be examined with a new optic, a new perspective, a new light. Why? Because when you begin to understand that perspective, then it begins to make some sense why we have the chronic diseases and maladies that we do over the last 130 years. Because it turns out when man first got control, real control of light, it started in 1874. Truthfully, it was before that, uh, but that's really when it ramped up. And it turns out almost every single one of the chronic diseases that we all know today were almost unheard of 130, 140 years yes, ago. Absolutely. We tended to die from very different things back then than we did now. And also contrary to popular belief, the average lifespan wasn't 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years. We've been living the same length of time the whole time. The only thing that varied that average number, again, back to numbers again, was that kids tended to die early and um, that skewed the lifespan. But humans have been living between 70 and 80, 80 years, probably for the last 200,000 years. Right. And the problem is there was just a research paper actually released this month that actually said that statement. I remember making that statement 10 years ago when people looked at me like I was batshit crazy. But I'm like, look, you just, humans are really good at talking, but they're really shitty at observing. Yeah. And the thing is, when you really become, when you decide to get on the path of being a mitochondria, that's when you zip your mouth up and then you really start to observe things and pay attention. I always tell, I just did a podcast probably about six weeks ago where I made the comment to the person interviewing me that the single most important thing to a mitochondria is when you hear an enigma, a mystery, a paradox, immediately to you, that should say, no, it's not. I need to figure out why this in fact happens because guess what? Once I do, it may open my mind or my perspective to something that I've missed. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to food, I think the, the biggest way to erase the crap that people believe 
is to realize what I told you already. The entire food web comes from photosynthesis. So then my next question is to the skeptic, to the critic, tell me how much you know about electrons. Yeah. Tell me how much you know about protons. And then tell me how much you know about photons. And then we can have a discussion where it's even keel. Right. Because most of the stuff that I teach my people is actually about the nuance between electrons, protons, and light. And it turns out that those little nuances, what I like to call nonlinear effects, and I'll, I'll define nonlinear for your people here because this is really important to get. <laughs> nonlinear is a small stimulus, leads to a seismic change in the macro, macroscopic world. So it means the smallest little nano quantum change can radically change things in the macroscopic world you call reality. So another manifestation of that would be whether you believe in God or evolution, immaterial for this discussion, but the elevation of chimp to homo. We know by science there are nearest relatives, but if you look at a chimp and you look at a human, you're like, wait a minute. You know, we may be closely related, but God, we're so different. Right. And reason for that difference is the nonlinear effects that occurred in the mitochondria of to how electrons, protons, and light were ordered and where it first occurred. And, and as, as hard to fathom as that is for people, that's the truth. So and, it's kind of like the statement that I give to my clients when I say, we're just going to change these little things and they add up to big results. So what you're saying, if I'm understanding this right, is small changes yield big results. But these, these small mito hacks... But small changes done to the correct things. Right, exactly. Not, not the things that don't matter. See, here's the flip side of the mitochondria. I should say the mitochondria point. Okay. If you focus in on the wrong things like the food gurus, right. guess what? That's when you get Einstein's you know, axiom. You keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. That's insanity. And that's See, not that's true because if you think about how many people are doing this diet after that diet and this diet after that diet, and yet they go, you know, I just don't see results like I think I'm going to or like I did when I was in my 20s and it was so easy to lose weight. And I want to tell them, then stop doing the same thing. Maybe it's not food that you need to be looking at. Maybe it's something else. And I think what I wanted to bring to the table was, so we, we've established that nutrition is only a third. And I, I will kind of look at it from the standpoint of think about how many cultures there are and how many different diets there are and how many people thrive on these different diets. No matter what they're eating, it's completely different from what this person's eating and that person's eating, but yet there's people that thrive on that. So there really is no wrong way. You have to find what we've termed out in the society now as the woe, your way of eating, what works for you. And then, but outside of that, I'm sure that what we need to talk about today is what every single human can and will benefit from is these mito hacks because we all have mitochondria. And doing all these things that I want you to touch on are the things that we can all have in common and stop arguing about which way of eating is more appropriate for the human race when every single culture out there has its own way of eating that resonates with that culture and that, that they thrive on. And uh, can, you, can you talk about that? Like, can you agree yeah, I mean, that maybe nutrition isn't as important as these things that apply to every single human? Well, what people don't realize is that a mitochondria also are not the same. For example, okay. people that live inside the 20s, or that's where their people eventually came from, those people have what we call coupled haplotypes. That means they don't uncouple protons so they make heat. Why? You don't need heat when you live inside the tropics because you have the sun to always power you. And I know what now, you mean by the 20s, but explain it to my listeners so they hear it directly from you. Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. It's 20 north and 20 south. Why? In that area, the sun, the solar variation is very minimal. So there's usually 12 hours of sunlight, you know, pretty much all the time in that range. Where the sun radically changes is above the 20s on both hemispheres. Here's the interesting part. Most of the people in the world today, out of the 7.5 billion people, tend to come from a northern European ancestry. How do we know that? We know that from all the stuff from 23andMe and Ancestry.com, all the people have actually got their stuff done. But it turns out there's there's only about 26 different haplogroups. And when you say, when you said earlier, society and culture, 
I almost wanted to cut you off with the legs there because okay. that's really not the case. It's actually latitude and longitude, and then it gets it, then it gets even more freaky in terms of micro domains. And the reason for that is you could actually live on the planet uh, in a microclimate that uses, say, C3 or C4 plants. These are different photosynthetic mechanisms that build the food webs. There's actually three of them. Each one of them handle hydrogen protons differently. And if you happen to live in one of those places, well, guess what? Your mitochondria is designed to pay attention to that. So where your diet comes from, your culture, should really be restated saying where your geography links to your haplotype is important. Then what alters the haplotype? In other words, what's the next gear that fine tunes the haplotype? That's what people call single nucleotide polymorphisms. That's the SNPs. Yeah. Then the yeah. single amino acid polymorphisms, which are further gear shifts. Where did they come from? Those things came from after we migrated out of Africa. And everybody knows that happened about 200,000 years ago. And we went all in different directions in different ways. But the radiation of human migration has a huge impact on what we do. So for example, just to make this simple, because I know we're getting deep into the science here, but I want people to understand it. Most people know that I favor a certain way for eating for most of the people on the planet because most of those people have Northern European haplotypes. That's the reason Jack says it. But if you happen to be an equatorial person and you told me you wanted to be a vegan, as long as you told me you had no glasses, no sunglasses, nothing on your skin, I'm okay with you being vegan in that area because do I think you can make it? Yes. But if you're a moron and you live in Denmark and you're six foot five with blonde hair and white as a ghost and think you can be a vegan at the 52nd latitude, you're, you're going to wind up on YouTube shooting somebody at YouTube because that's precisely what will happen. And that's what we call a circadian mismatch that leads to a mitochondrial mismatch. So it's really that leads to inflammation in it. Yeah. So it's really about not so much like I said, like society and culture, as much as that. Where are you currently, and where did you come from, basically? Where was your? It's more complicated than that. I'm going to say yes to your answer, but okay. when I break it down for you, I'll give you a, a perfect for example, uh, and I'm going to give you two examples that link to this so that your people understand why mito acts are important. Okay. Um, there's, there's an isoform, which is called an isotope of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And most people know hydrogen is the first atom on the periodic table. It's called H plus. Our mitochondria matrix is filled with it. But there's another one called deuterium. Okay. And our blood is filled with deuterium. That's an isotope of hydrogen. Well, on planet earth, this is the third rock from the sun. We go from 29 parts per million in the crust to 160 parts, different in different parts of the land masses all over. One of the beliefs that the, probably the most famous mitochondrial researcher has, and I have, is that it's linked, the amount of deuterium is linked to where the haplotypes came from, and also the latitudes and longitudes on the planet. And if you really look at that, that kind of gives you a clue that deuterium is related, the deuterium content in the soil where plants, photosynthesis grows, can actually set the metabolic rates of different mitochondria as we begin to migrate. So if you happen to have, say, an equatorial DNA from Nairobi, which is, you know, a couple of degrees north on the equator in Africa, but then you move to Detroit, it, it would be no shock that most of your ancestors after that in Detroit may develop a disease like autism. Why? Mm. Because technically, when you go from a coupled haplotype to an uncoupled world, what are you doing? The ATPase that makes energy spins slower. Mm. So this is just like a power plant, you know, wherever you live, that if you don't make as much energy, the, the amount of energy drops, you start to manifest diseases. And that's actually what Dr. Doug Wallace, who's the guy that figured all this stuff out about mitochondria, he was one of the guys that was linked in those original six papers. Um, he basically found that we inherit our mitochondria just from mom. Right. And when we get it from mom, 
Um, she sets the power plant situation. The, the key thing is the decisions that you make after that radically impact that. So just because you think you can live in New York City, if you happen to be Somali or you happen to be, say, uh, Kenyan, that may not be the optimal thing. You can certainly go visit there, but it would probably not be wise for you to relocate there long term because eventually you're going to create a problem. And it turns out the problem that you've created is that your mitochondria can't uncouple in cold temperature. Mm -hmm. So not only that, you're going to do really poor. If you happen to eat, say, a, a predominantly plant-based diet, you're really going to struggle in a place like that because you're going to create more inflammation because you're going to slow down your metabolic rate even quicker. You know, you mentioned something probably 10 or 15 minutes ago, and I was going to stop you, and I didn't. When you said that your client said, hey, when I was 20, I lose weight. Well, do you know the reason why? It gets right back to this story. Because when you're 20 years old, and this is before, you know, 0G to 5G in the terms of the EMF networks, talk about before we had all that. What Wallace found is that the degree of our metabolic rate is best when we're in our first and second decade. Mm. The reason why people had no problems losing weight when they were younger is because their mitochondria is in tip-top shape. Mm. So no matter what they eat, you can tolerate it. But what happens? What did Wallace also find? Every decade that we age, our heteroplasm rate, which is what this change in mitochondria is called, goes up 10%. Mm -hmm. So say if you're 55 years old, you're in your sixth decade, that means you have 60% heteroplasm. What do we know from the old medical literature? Forget about the new stuff. We know that the diseases of aging began to show up at that 60% threshold. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Wallace has done a lot of research to show that those diseases show up now, uh, show up then, no matter what. In other words, it's not the anti-aging guys like Aubrey de Grey who think that we're going to live to 200 years old by doing some kind of crazy shit through his, you know, his science. But that's really not the way we're built to operate. Aging is built into the sauce, okay? And we're all nobody that's listening to this podcast is getting out of here alive. We're all going to die, and we're going to die. A mitochondrial death. That's actually what all our somatic cells are designed to do. Our cells are designed to die through a process called apoptosis, but it does that to support the germ cell, which is going to be the future generation. The yeah, key is is, is oh, yeah, understanding how it mixes together. And once you begin to understand how this stuff links together. When the environment changes so that heteroplasmy starts to rise, say in your second and third decade, instead of your sixth and seventh, this is how you begin to see some diseases um, that shouldn't be present today, but now are becoming ridiculously present. Like That's part of the thyroidism, basically. I, there's a lot. It's not just like hypothyroidism. Take the top ten list right now in medicine and go back 50 years and you'll see that the top 10 wasn't even close to the same. Right. The reason is we our environment more in the last 50 years than they have in the last 6 million years. That's the real problem. And it turns out the perspective that I, I want to teach people is that the environmental change is actually what mitochondria are designed to pay attention to and they pay attention to it by the use of energy and information that are coded for in electrons and protons and light. And this is the reason why I've got to teach you a little bit of physics to understand my perspective. And then when you get it, you start to go, wow, this kind of makes some sense. Now I can understand why people are getting hypothyroidism today when 50 years ago, Hardly anybody had Hashimoto's. Now, almost every woman's got it. Right. He's got hypothyroidism. Right. And one thing I wanted to touch on what you had said is I've had plenty of clients who have said, what do you mean I can't eat a banana? I live in the Midwest. They're plenty plentiful at the grocery store. 
And I said, are you of tropical descent? You, uh, In my opinion, you have no business. And where we live, you have kind of no business having a banana because that's that deuterium you're talking about. Can't it come from those? I mean, can't it be worse in foods that aren't made for us and also not um, in the latitude that we're living in, like these foods that are only available yeah. in, in, you know, even coconut oil is so popular, for example. But do we as Northern Europeans have any business eating coconut oil or is it could it be more toxic for us than than something that's that we're accustomed to in our culture or this our latitude. Is, this, is, this is a great question you're bringing up because it's actually going to be um, a, a, a Patreon blog that I'm releasing this month. Um, <laughs> I'm a Patreon I, I, been, member, so I'm ready. <laughs> uh, I've been, I've been uh, giving people lots of hacks to do, and there's a specific hack coming about coconut oil that's pretty much going to blow people's minds because it links directly to the coming 5G network. And I, I'm going to make a prediction about coconut oil is going to replace a macronutrient uh, in the human diet when 5G goes live. And this is going to happen probably in the next 24 months. Some places it's already happened. But the answer to you, uh, prior to, say, 1990, I would tell you that you could probably use coconut oil and get away with it. But your your discussion about the banana, it really rings true to me because when I was at Paleo FX that first year, I'll never forget it. I was on the stage and I made the comment uh, that if you think you can eat a banana in Boston on December 31st and get away with it, you're a moron. And I'll never forget, there was a Harvard psychiatrist who tried to argue with me about it very famous in the paleo community. She's subsequently been kind of marginalized because I think people realized that she had a pretty myopic focus on carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. But the interesting thing is now the, the chronobiology that's come out in the last 10 years has proven that I'm correct about this. And the reason why is because the electrons, protons in the um, banana need to be matched to the light environment that the eye and the skin also see. So when what your gut senses is not equivalent to what the eye and skin get from light, that creates a mismatch. And when I say the word mismatch, uh, I want your listeners to think about the word chaos. The word chaos, I think most people can resonate with and they understand. What do we call the word chaos or mismatch in medicine? It's called inflammation. Yes. And it turns out that inflammation is a rhythmic scale of protons. That's H+. Plus. Well, it turns out that when you add deuterium to the mix, because it's an isotope, it creates more inflammation than H+, plus does. And it turns out bananas have a lot more deuterium in it than H+. Plus. doesn't mean it's bad, because a banana inside the 28th latitude which is where Jack lives now. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, bananas grow here year round in New Orleans. And just a block away, it's not there anymore because we had a bad freeze in December, but I have a neighbor that had a banana tree and we used to go by. In fact, in December, it had bananas all growing in on it. Mm-hmm. And my rule is very simple. You can eat donuts or jelly donuts when they grow on trees mm-hmm. in the neighborhood that you're in. And if they don't, then you shouldn't be eating it. Amen. And it's the same thing with fruit. <laughs> but it's the same thing with fruit. It's yeah. the same thing with anything else. Absolutely. And the I'm nice thing is this exempts proteins and fats because if an animal lives in that area, that means you can eat the animal. And I'm talking about from an ancestral standpoint. I'm not talking about you taking a penguin and bringing it back to Fort Myers, Florida <laughs> and saying, okay, well, it's here. I can eat it. That's kind of a little bit stretching the truth. Well, and I want to jump in there too before I want you to t- definitely touch on the coconut oil thing because the, I'm so intrigued by this. But while I have you on this subject of like animal food where it's where it's grown and where you are, I want your opinion on the carnivore uh, diet that's really popular right now because I only jumped on it 
in the in the middle of winter when my husband brought home a deer and I said, you know what, if we lived off the land right now where we live, this is all we would have access to is this deer. Like there is no vegetation, there is no fruit growing, there's no grain. You get the animal and that's what you eat. So I wanted to see if you feel like this carnivory that's going on is relevant for a time and for a latitude and for a season, but, but your thoughts on doing it long term for these individuals that are doing it currently. Yeah, I don't think doing it long term makes any sense from a biological perspective, but here's where I flip the switch. Okay. With the changes that are coming in the environment, that may no longer be true. This is very important for your people to understand. Okay. What was true in our evolutionary past, I don't believe is going to be true any further. And the reason I make that statement is because I've been doing biohacks for the last 10 or 15 years. I've seen changes in biohacks that I did. In other words, things I did 10 or 15 years ago no longer work. And the reason that they don't work happens to be that the environment that we're all living in no longer is the same. And most of us don't realize that's the case, but it actually is the case. And it's getting ready to go through its next iteration uh, very soon. And if you happen to live in the wrong place, that change is gonna hit you faster, and you need to be aware of it. So when you ask me the question that you asked me, the reason why I hedge my bets, uh, I think being a carnivore ties to the power density of the season. So for example, you're in autumn, you're in winter, and even parts of spring, especially if you're above the 30th latitude, the answer is, uh, and this is a generalized stereotypical answer, yeah, I'm fine with that. But here's the key. When you get into late spring and summer, you need to flip the switch, just like photosynthesis does, for where you are. Because even at the, the 60th latitude, uh, you will have carbohydrates growing in that neck of the woods. Therefore, you, there's a reason for you to eat them. And it turns out the reason why nature wants you to eat them when the power density is high, because you need that deuterium into your mitochondria to actually turn your bad engines over to good engines. In other words, this is called recycling. Mm -hmm. Most people know that. We have a fancy name for that in, in medicine and science. It's called mitophagy or autophagy. Okay. Now, the big thing in the carnivorous diet, one of the things that they tend to add is intermittent fasting and also um, fasting like water fast and things like that. Well, it turns out there's tons of papers out there about fasting increases autophagy. What most of those people don't realize is that if you perform fasting at the wrong time or in the wrong latitude, it will not have as big an effect. And that's the reason why you'll see You'll read 50 papers about fasting or autophagy, and you'll notice that there's uneven results. The reason why is they, they never have any light controls or seasonal controls. Right. Most of these studies, right. you also need to realize, here's the big problem, the real big problem. Most of these studies are done on mammals that are rodents that are neural, human diurnal. Here's the key thing. If you have no light controls, the insights that you get from these papers often are wrong. This this invokes what we said earlier. There's a nonlinear effect. If you take a nocturnal mammal study and think it's going to work in a, in a, a diurnal human, you're going to make a nonlinear effect change, and it could lead to a real problem. Yes. And Definitely. this is what people do not understand in the nutrition literature, um, and these can lead to bad effects. I, I, I told you before, I was talking to a friend on Facebook about arguing with him about food and that's when we got into a discussion about melatonin taking oral melatonin and I said look this is the reason why it's a bad idea it thins your retina we know this from ECT studies and the thing is there's a bunch of idiots out there selling supplements to people who can't sleep taking melatonin well they don't realize that the long-term issue may be that you're gonna get cataracts early I get AMD early then you're gonna lead to neurodegeneration early just because you couldn't sleep and you have to realize the melatonin pill that you take and the melatonin that you make in your gut and your eye and your brain is not equivalent. Why? Because it's designed to be in what we call a thermo-coupled uh, unit. Everything in biology is based on a negative and positive feedback loop. So when you look at that loop right here and you add something exogenous to it, it decouples the system. And anytime you decouple a system, 
You extinguish one side of it, the other side also gets extinguished. Mm. That's what happens with predators and prey. Like it happened in Yellowstone Park. When we took the wolves out to save the deer and the buffalo, what happened? They both wound up going away. What happened when we brought the wolves back? Everybody got healthy. That's, right. That's how biology works. It works not through linear thinking. And this is why humans are really poor observers because they in a linear fashion. Why? Because we believe in cause and effect. How many times have you heard in, in studies that, oh, this is correlation, not causation? Mm -hmm. And what do I say, especially on Twitter, to these obedient idiots to the paradigm? Nature is based on probability. It's called quantum electrodynamic theory. It's not based on cause and effect. In fact, quantum mechanics tells us there is no cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Guess what? There's a lot of sense and it's counterintuitive sense that maybe correlation is more important to understand than causation. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I really have to agree with what you said because lately I've been moving towards adding a few things that are only in season where we live in April and May back into my carnivorous way because I just felt it would be unusual if I kept eating all meat during the spring and summer when everything was coming into fruition. So I really appreciate you saying that. I wanted you to go back to um, what you were saying about the coconut oil and 5G. And just to, also, I'm sure you're going to have to briefly explain to people what 5G is because maybe not everybody's going to be familiar with that, even though I've put out podcasts, but I don't know if people are listening, so they'll listen to you. <laughs> well, if, if people are listening to this, I mean, what we're talking about is actually the uh, – electromagnetic radiation that humans now use to communicate. Back in the early 90s, it, it was when we had dial-up analog signals. Right. Most people probably remember that with AOL and that stupid dial tone that you used to hear. That was what we call zero G. Okay. And then it's morphed to 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. Most of the United States right now is on a 3G and 4G network. Mm -hmm. Basically what it means, the power density increased between zero G and 5G. 5G is where we're at right now. As the power density changes, your mitochondria react differently. Turns out that the EMF that you're designed to work with is solar EMF. That forms one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for people to wrap their heads around this, there's 73 different octaves. What does that mean? We go from radio waves all the way up to cosmic radiation. People know that. Bad stuff in between that you know about, that's, that's where x-rays are. That's mm -hmm. where cosmic radiation is. That's where gamma rays are. Yeah. That's where um, things that you've probably heard of. Microwaves are there. Infrared waves are there. Radio waves, extreme low frequency UHF, which we used to use as analog uh, signals for TV and, and radio broadcasts, which were subsequently changed by Obama in 2009. Mm -hmm. These things have mm -hmm. all radically changed in your lifetime. And the thing is, you don't realize that all this electromagnetic radiation is bouncing off the ionosphere around you, and your mitochondria is paying attention to it. And when your mitochondria pays attention to it, it ruins the two programs in the mitochondria. And you've heard me mention one of them already, but we might as well talk about the other side. The thermodynamic couple in a mitochondria is called autophagy. That's the recycling of bad engines. And the other side is apoptosis, that's cell suicide. Right. And mm -hmm. those two programs are the self-regulatory programs that run mitochondria. It turns out that 0G to 5G uncouples those systems. And when you uncouple the system, autophagy gets broken. That's where every single disease that your listeners know about comes from. And that's chaos, when yeah. Right. And when both of them get broken, that's where you get the real serious diseases like neurodegeneration. And the big one is cancer. Yeah. That's actually when you get what we call a redox shift in your mitochondria called the Warburg shift, which yeah. some of your you know, more astute listeners probably have heard of before, but they really don't understand what people are shocked to hear, especially in my world. My members kind of know this is that the Warburg shift really isn't pathologic. Everybody believes in the food world, especially in the low-carb, high-fat world, that the Warburg shift is bad. It turns out some of the most important cells in your body 
actually use the Warburg shift every single day to operate. Those are the ones in your retina. Those are your red blood cells. There's even a cell in your eye called the Mueller cell that I've written about before that actually is an obligate glycolytic cell. In other words, it has, it doesn't use its mitochondria at all. Um, what's the other big cell that you'll be shocked to hear about? That's embryonic stem cells in your body. And why is that? It only uses glucose and another pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. And the reason why the body is really slick, you, you are designed to use those two pathways when you don't have a lot of oxygen around. So I want you to think about this because you brought it up earlier about your daughter. When you have a baby, you have an embryo that's fertilized and you have your uterus right here. That egg has to implant into the wall of your uterus. That's why it gets thick with the endometrium. Well, in that process, while that's happening, it takes like a week or so to happen. That embryo is pseudo-hypoxic or hypoxic. It doesn't have any oxygen at all. So most of us who are listening to this think, oh, well, we don't have oxygen. We're going to die. Well, guess what? That means your cells have to have a solution for when oxygen levels are low because it's got to protect those stem cells. Do you remember what we said earlier in the podcast when I said that <clears throat> your somatic cells have this apoptotic program, this cell suicide program to protect the germline? Yeah. Well, guess how it works? Yeah. It uses glucose and it uses this pentose phosphate pathway and low oxygen tension to work. What's the flip side? What happens when you have too much oxygen in that situation where you're using glycolysis and the PPP? That's cancer. Mm. And guess what happens? Cancer cells use that. That's why they upregulate glucose metabolism and the urea cycle through something called glutamine, which is an amino acid. That's not important for this discussion, but this is the one that is important. All cancers are associated with high oxygen tensions. That's the reason why they bring blood supplies to them. And they use the Warburg shift. That's the key difference between your embryonic stem cells. And the reason why your body uses it with low oxygen is because it's trying to protect all your stem cells in your body. Mm -hmm. See, that's the protection mechanism mm -hmm. that's built into you. And guess what protects you from that? Apoptosis and autophagy. And when they don't work like they're supposed to, that's when the shit hits the fan. And that's the key. So when a food girl, because I know... I know there's probably 90% of people listening to this have heard, especially from the low carb, the carnivore people. This is the reason why I really want to focus in on this because it's very important. When someone tells you to eat ketogenic 24 seven or eat like a rabbit 24 seven and they don't understand this little nuance that we're talking about now, you could be making a catastrophic mistake right. for your right. germline and also for your somatic cells. That's the reason why you have to be very careful. And the, the reason I bring it up is because most Americans especially know this, we have a massive problem right now in the United States with infertility and nobody seems to know the reason why. Well, guess what? This little thing, the reason I brought it up is to make you realize that the cause of this problem is because autophagy and apoptosis aren't working in the somatic cells, and that programs the germ cells not to work. Right. And that's the key. And when you turn that off, it leads to massive problems. So one of, uh, on my website today, I had an unfortunate um, new member from Europe, you know, put in that their three-year-old daughter just got diagnosed with a, a stage four, you know, cancer, probably a medulloblastoma, which is really, really bad. And the thing is, my profession is going, I know what, exactly what the pediatric neurosurgeon is going to tell the mom and dad. They're going to say, oh, it's a chromosome 17 problem, you know, because they didn't separate and this, that, and they're going to blame it on the nuclear genes. When the real story is, the germ cell that that baby came from, the mitochondria, were bad before the sperm ever met it. Wow. That's the real problem. And the thing is, when you tell someone a half-truth and you never get them to the, the full answer, they're never going to understand why your germ cell can be made bad when apoptosis and autophagy are broken in mom 
when she's 20 years old, right. before she ever is married, before she ever has a kid, before she even knows. And it gets even worse than that because the girl, the 20 year old who's not pregnant now, may have had the egg that's in her programmed by her mom because her mom was Cindy Lauper or her mom was uh, Lady Gaga or her mom was Madonna. And I'm using these people because these are people that live mismatched yes. lives. That's yes. part of the reason why mm -hmm. they have their own separate issues now. And the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm about fed up. I mean, you know this yourself. I'm about fed up really talking about proteins, fats, and carbohydrates for the reasons already mentioned in this podcast. Right. But you probably are sensing how angry I am about the genetic paradigm that we believe everything is tied to DNA and the nuclear genome when it turns out the truth is, and Doug Wallace says this, Doug Wallace believes that 85% of diseases that man faces today are mitochondria. I got on a podcast that I did, my own YouTube live stream event that I did with my buddy Jeremy and Ben, I said that I believe the number is really closer to 95%. Mm -hmm. I believe most of the things are mitochondria, mm -hmm. and I say that because since my perspective has been changed in the last 10 or 15 years, I now, 10 years ago, I would never be able to look at this case that showed up on my website today about the three-year-old and been able to explain definitively to the mom and dad really how this happened. Now, the science of mitochondrial medicine has matured so much that it is blatantly obvious what the problem is. But you know what we said when we first started this podcast? And I told you, it takes 20 to 25 years to go from the research papers with scientists and clinicians that know how to decipher the science appropriately yeah. to lead clinical solutions. So the reason why I became a mitochondriac, because I realized this as a doctor, you can make huge impacts in your own health when you learn how to focus in on what matters and what doesn't, then hack it. Yeah, and then. Like you, won't fall prey. you won't fall prey to these randomized controlled trials that tell you to take statins or you know SSRIs because they worked 57% of the time in people that you have no relation to at all from a mitochondrial perspective. That's the mindset. That's the perspective that you have to come to life. And this is decided a very different perspective than what I was taught in school. And when I tell you that for me, the script has flipped 180 degrees, it's pretty accurate. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty hardcore the other way now. Uh, and this is the reason why, you know, people have called me incorrigible, arrogant, and uh, a prick, to be quite honest with you. Because when I hear half truth, it absolutely makes my blood boil. Because these are how we make mistakes. And and when, when I say half truth, really, it's a synonym for what I told you earlier. It's a non-linear effect that we don't understand where this big, huge change came from, a small, free radical signal change in the mitochondria when oxygen was present. Yeah. That's how simple the problem can be. Well, and to, and to that effect, like I've even heard people refer to you as that, but I, what I wanted to people to know is that someone who is putting this stuff out, is pa it's passion. So you can come across as arrogant or whatever, but it's people that really understand and read your blogs and read what's in the forums and things like that, they will see that this is a passionate human being who now has reversed from you know, just doing surgeries to actually fixing people from a mitochondrial standpoint. And so I do want to commend you on that. People can think what they think, but anybody that knows what you're writing and knows how passionate are you are will, will understand. Um, but going al along with what you're talking about, like these germ cells and the this this sad this is very unfortunate this little person and all of us walking around with this potential for disease, let's let's take them through some mito hacks that are prominent with you that you want to relay to people and also you know why we need them based on the 5g and based on wi-fi everywhere we go and based on not getting enough sunlight and not getting enough connection to the earth so please i want you to just fill them in on your best ways to enhance our our mitochondria yeah the number one thing that 
you just need to see the sunrise every single morning you get up. If you don't, you're making a catastrophic mistake. Probably the second most important thing uh, is if you can try to see the sunset or at least be around and see it because that tells you your brain how to set this, um, what you've probably heard of before called the adrenal stress index, which is a test. I'm not interested in the test. I'm trying to get your cortisol and melatonin uh, cycle right. And the reason why it turns out your cortisol and melatonin curve is a, a, another synonym for apoptosis and autophagy. When it's flat, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. I will, and I will attest to that because if I don't go out and get early morning light, I have trouble sleeping that night. So it's like what you say, well, I've heard you say before is like what you do at the first part of the day determines how you're going to sleep and how you're going to spend your evening the last part of the day. Right, because that's what actually sets the circadian mechanism that actually tells your mitochondria exactly what its metabolic rate should be. That's the key. People need to understand that. The other big, big thing is not only seeing the sunrise, but you're doing it now. Uh, I also want you to put blue blockers on your eyes and cover as much as your skin up when you do go out at night. And that's the time where I'm going to tell ladies that I'm okay with you putting as much freaking makeup on your face as you want. But guess what? In the daytime, right. I don't want you to have any makeup on your face. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because guess what? Your skin, eye, and gut need to get a coherent light signal. What does that mean? Meaning that the same power density from the season has to hit all three places because if you're giving it a different message, you're creating a problem. And really what the problem you're creating is the two key, pro, the two key uh, subatomic particles that your mitochondria deals with is the electron. That makes free radicals. Most of you have heard that word. What a free radical is, it's a, a molecule that has one unpaired electron. Mm -hmm. It's missing its mm -hmm. twin. Okay. That is a magnet inside your mitochondria that impacts energy and information to different parts of your body to do different things. The other magnet in your body is called a hydrogen proton, H+. It also acts as a magnet, and in your mitochondrial matrix, there's trillions of them. In fact, that's what runs your ATPase that makes ATP. Every second that we've been talking on this thing, 1,500 protons per second make the ATPA spin. Turns out when you're in sunlight, the red part of the spectrum makes that engine spin double the speed, almost 3,000 protons per second. So when you begin to understand that you're wirelessly designed from an electric and magnetic field effect to be connected to the earth and the sun, that's the real wireless connection you need. Right not the one that's occurring on Skype between me and you. Because guess what? That creates an interference pattern. Yeah. That interference pattern is the problem. Why? Because when we use technology, what do we do? It brings us from outside to inside yeah. at the wrong time yeah. of the day. That's the real problem. So when people get the basics, and that really is the basics, that's the number one mito hack to get, then I think when you decide to get a little bit more fancy, that's when I think you could, uh, you probably could get your uh, haplotype check, you know, with the Ancestry or 23andMe if you want. Then find out what your SNP profile is because it may turn out that you'll realize that the location that you're currently living in may be completely the wrong decision for what your mitochondrial biology is set for. And that may be the reason why you've got a big issue. And believe it or not, I think that issue right there makes up about 30 to 40 percent of the people that I've come across in the last 10 years. That that is really one of their big problems. Probably the number one issue right now is people who have a certain haplotype are just not optimized to live in a 3G, 4G, and 5G network. Mm -hmm. Those are the people mm -hmm. that have to make some really tough social, social, and emotional decisions about what they do. And those are the people that really have to do some extraordinary things, you know, in terms of their diet, their light environment. And when, when I tell people this, what, the most important diet when you have my perspective is your technology diet. Yeah. Almost all yeah. of us need to go on a technology diet. In fact, we need technology fasts. Yeah. Technology fasts improve autophagy, okay? Much more so than you not eating food. And, uh, you know, 
I don't think I've ever said that before in a podcast. I like but that. It's absolutely true. It's, but it's true. It true. It's absolutely true. Yeah. And, and you know, instead of stressing all... the body, it de-stresses the body. Because fasting for some individuals can cause too much stress, especially if they have adrenal issues, whereas a electronic fast would actually enhance their body and de-stress their body. So. Correct. And it's counterintuitive because people don't understand really that adrenal problems start in the eye. It's actually a brainstem problem at the paraventricular nucleus, and it, it really comes from being blue light toxic. Mm. And almost everybody today is blue light toxic. Yeah, Nobody which wants is why to... adrenal issues are on the rise, too. Well, no doubt. But it's, it's not it, – the functional medicine guys keep confusing the hell out of people because people actually think there's something wrong with their adrenal gland. There's nothing wrong with their adrenal gland. The problem is the signaling mechanism between the eye and the brainstem to the paraventricular nucleus that controls the lymphatic nervous system. That's the real problem. And the thing is, they just do testing on you to see where you're at. Well, a, a moron could do that. The key thing is you have to tell people what it is they need to do. Giving them a supplement, giving them a different diet, putting on an autoimmune protocol is an absolute abject waste of time because it never gets to the core issue. It's kind of like you're trying to fix a quantum problem with food, and when you don't realize that it's a quantum problem to begin with, using food, it, it, it's almost like uh, the Poles going in to fight the Nazis in the, in the war with spears and muskets. It was ridiculous. That's really what the state of functional medicine is. You know, they tried to sell to the public that – you know, they're better than allopathic medicine. I'm, I'm going to be the first one to tell you. I don't believe that. I think across the board, there's good and bad in every single branch of, of medicine and healthcare. The problem is, I think people need to do a better job of vetting the people that they call their experts by asking them really good questions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have good questions to ask, then that means you need to work on yourself to get to the point to ask that good question. So let me tell you something. If you sat down with a doc and they and they said to you, like if you had cancer and they said, hey, your diet really doesn't matter, you should immediately get up and just leave because they just told you that they truly don't understand mitochondrial mess. And if, if you mention the word Doug Wallace or you bring up the word mitochondria and and or you ask them, hey, how much do you know about mitochondria? And the answer is, and then just say, okay, tell me, tell me what's the, the the last three things you learned about mitochondria that have intrigued you. Their answers will define if you want to stay in that office or not. Right. Or if they even answer it, or if they don't change the subject and go but into well, what they're normally talking they, about. They actually gave you the answer you came Right. To. Yeah, exactly. But you have to be the person that's why. See, yeah. I call people who don't do this obedient idiots. And the reason why I call them that is because their dopamine state is so low because yes, they're I'm so, so glad you're talking about this because I love this topic. Like th this is why they're not asking questions. Right. Because their dopamine level is not optimized for sunlight. If, you know, the, the, the best way to get people to follow trends going on around them is just put them in the sun, especially in the morning. It, it, they'll self-correct. Why? Because your body is designed to work with sunlight. It's not designed to work with your emails. And the, the if people could relate to this, if they'll think about how they feel when they go camping or they go hiking and they're out in nature and how different they feel than when they stare at a computer all day in a cubicle, like they would they would get this. They would understand, oh, that is true. I do feel better when I'm camping or out in nature versus when I'm stuck in a cubicle. It has nothing to do that you're at work. It has everything to do with, like you said, the actual Wi-Fi signal that we need is that connection to the earth and our, our, our looking towards the sun. And so I want you to touch a little bit more about like the – I had a kind of a riddle for you. Like, do you think there was a reason why Steve Jobs wore a black turtleneck? And like, do you yeah. think that he knew something about blue light and those opsins well, in your skin? Yeah, I, there's no doubt that he did. But I mean, I told my members uh, a long time ago, this is literally five or six years ago. Um, when Apple truly outed itself was when the iPad came out. And if you remember... The first iteration, the first change to the iPad uh, and the iPhone was to put an infrared heat detector on the phone to turn it off. Well, 
if radiation wasn't a big problem, why would you put that in? Right. The reason why Apple did that is because they realized that if somebody put that phone or device in, on or close to their body, it could harm them. So down the road, they would be able, from a legal perspective, to say, hey, look, you know, our devices were built with this safe, fail safe in it. The thing is, here's the interesting thing. You go back, you go back and look at when this came out, not one time did it ever show up in an Apple lab that that actually was built into their device. Mm -hmm. That told you all you need to know. Remember, he died of a retroperitoneal cancer. There's pictures of him all over the internet that showed his iPhone in his back pocket and who coined the term laptop? Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. When you put the computer on your lap, guess what? You, you're bringing it very close to the retroperitoneal space. So I'm going to tell you, it's no mystery why he got what he got. And when you, after he died and his memoirs came out, and you saw that he would not even let his own kids use his own technology, that should be an eye opener. Now, Bill Gates is still alive. And we just found out the same thing is true with him. So if they are doing this, and they happen to live in areas that don't have a lot of non-native EMF, here, here's a shocking thing that most people don't know. If you go to Menlo Park in California, you will find that the cell signal isn't very strong mm. compared to other places like Santa Rosa. The reason why is they have so much money, they know what they're doing is bad. Look, they are as bad as the cigarette tobacco users. They know it's going to be proven probably within the next yeah. five or ten years. You just look at what's going on on the news recently with Zuckerberg and Facebook right. and Apple. It's coming out like left and right that kids are addicted. Well, how do you get addicted to anything, whether it's drugs, you know, uh, booze or anything? It affects your dopamine reward network in your frontal lobes. Where does that begin? It begins in your eye. Well, guess what? When you're in the blue light screen and you don't get any purple or red light, your dopamine level drops. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it also ruins your pituitary function, which is why all these young kids are having infertility problems. Mm -hmm. It's not a mystery. It's only a mystery to people who don't understand yeah. the nonlinear yeah. aspects of life. That's the key. I love that. I'm so glad we touched on that because that was a really important piece I wanted you to talk about. Um, Another one that I am wanting you to dispel a myth before we went out of too much time, because I know this is your Friday evening. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I have a lot of people that say, you're crazy for thinking that I shouldn't wear sunscreen. And I'm a professional stand-up paddle athlete that doesn't wear sunscreen. I go out, I paddle for a couple hours, I built up my sun callus, I don't need sunscreen, I don't burn. I can go to Hawaii or wherever and be on the ocean for four or five hours and not have any issue. Um, and people think I'm crazy because they think I'm going to get skin cancer. But I want you to dispel the myth that we don't that we need to slather ourselves with sunscreen and think that we're doing something good for our body. Well, let, before I dispel the myth, let me tell you that there is a hint of truth what the dermatologists say. If you're the obedient idiot that sits in front of the TV and the computer for 12 hours a day, you probably need sunscreen. Okay, <laughs> but why that. you're going to get skin cancer is from the blue light. But here's, here's how your body's designed to work. When the sun rises in the morning, there's red and blue. The amount of red completely uh, is the antidote to the blue. The blue light in the sun is really good because it's what turns your pituitary on. When it turns the pituitary on, that's what makes all the hormones that everybody knows about. What turns the hormones off? The first sign of UV light. So that's UVA light. Now, when UV light shows up is different everywhere on the globe. Okay, if you could live in a place where it never shows up, so you're going to have those hormones teeming for a while. But signal has been the most broken signal. Ever. But the way the skin works is very interesting. You are built with natural sunscreen, mm -hmm. and the natural sunscreen starts in your skin at the bottom level of, of the skin, which has a specific name that goes all the way to the top. Most ladies know that the top layers of skin are dead. But what do y'all do? You spend all kinds of freaking money trying to pull all those dead layers off. And guess what? There's a physics effect called the auger effect, A-U-G-E-R. As those cells go from the, the rapidly dividing level to the top, what happens is the DNA opens up and the DNA denatures. That acts as a molecular sunscreen. 
to get rid of all the problems with UV light. I knew there was so, a reason why I didn't exfoliate. I don't like to exfoliate now. I know why. <laughs> what protects you from UVA and UVB light for a long time? Like, like the European guy, I'm built, my skin and my mitochondria are not built for the tropics. Yet I can stay out in the sun seven, eight, nine hours and not have a problem. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, there's a thing that's called building your callus. Most ladies, if they're listening to this, will understand. If you go out and buy those brand new pair of shoes that you love, you put them on and they hurt your feet and you're like, no, I'm buying these anyway because if I wear them a couple of times, they'll be okay. That's what's called breaking in your shoes. Everybody understands that. Well, that's exactly what AM Sun does to your skin. Here's the problem, ladies. It means your skin, your entire body, not your makeup, needs to be in that sun. Why? The red light in sun, okay, between probably, I'm going to say about 500 to 600 nanometers. It actually goes higher than that actually builds up your tolerance for the next diurnal variation. Mm -hmm. It's UVA. In other words, the more red light you get, the more UV protection you gain. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if you're what most idiots do who are listening to this, they go to the beach at 11 o'clock, stay there till 3, so they never saw the AM light, and they never see the PM light. Because believe it or not, you can build your solar callus up later in the day once UV goes away. If you decide... You don't want to go out to the beach early. The key is, in the spring, if you want to see this effect, you need to use early morning and late afternoon naked bathing mm -hmm. to improve this so that when you go out midday, you'll be able to tolerate. Now, if you have a Fitzpatrick skin score like I do, which is a one, mm -hmm. you're going to have to do this for a long time before you're able to do what I do. Uh, but the key thing is everybody listening to this, I don't care if you're black, white, purple, or green, this works. Yeah. The problem is you need to understand built into your skin and that detection system. Like when people get red, that's the detection system that you've exceeded your allotment based on where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, the key thing is, and this is the take home that I really want to make about, about sun exposure because this is not what you're going to hear from the dermatologists and ophthalmologists, but what I'm about to say has been axiomatically proven true in multiple studies. The more solar exposure you get, the cause, all causes of mortality drops. Yeah. So let me get this straight. I'm not talking about different diseases now. I'm talking about every disease under the sun. This has been data that most doctors want to bury. Why? Because the dermatologist can't explain it. And they make money off of people staying out of the sun. And here's the key. Those old brown ladies that you see in Florida, they're doing it right. I love that. What I want your people to get is I don't want them to think, oh, well, I can go into a red light uh, a tanning bed or a regular tanning bed and get the same effect. The answer is no. And the reason for that is that your listeners are probably not old enough like I am to remember the Pink Floyd album from 1969 when the sun ray came in and hit the prism and breaks into the seven colors. Sunlight, and again, this goes back to our original statement, it's a nonlinear effect. Each one of those colors has its own effect. It turns out that purple light has the biggest nonlinear effects. In fact, it's the only part of visible spectrum that controls all the nonlinear effects in biology every single one of them. And the auger effect that you just talked about is one of those not very well-known effects. So yes, you are built to be in the sun. And not only that, there's another chemical that's made with dopamine in the eye that you've probably heard of called POMC. That chemical makes beta endorphin, which is our natural opiate, Nature built you to be addicted to solar exposure. Yeah. Why? Because if you're not in the sun, you don't make this chemical. And that's the reason why people like Kurt Cobain, Prince, Michael Jackson, all killed themselves using drugs. Why? Because they lived an electromagnetic life at night, never, never went in the sun. Light. You think about all of you. 
And they were all, they all had mental issues. Mm -hmm. But the key was, what did they do? Because they had no beta endorphin naturally built by the sun, they used synthetic opiates to make it up. And here's the problem. Synthetic drugs don't have the same quantized effect as the sun. That's fantastic. So basically, like you said, people need to be putting on sunscreen and sunglasses indoors when they're on the computer and have their eyes exposed and their skin exposed when they're outside. <laughs> well, what my version of sunscreen is is what you're doing. The fact that you've got your neck covered, you got makeup on, and you got your blue blockers, this is perfect indoor attire for a mitochondria. Yes, and I only do makeup for a podcast for that reason. Not just to look aesthetically nice on the podcast, but also to block. This is my sunblock here from the blue light, too. The big, the big thing is then the flip side is, and this is the hardest thing for me to get through to Southern women. I want you naked as a jaybird with no makeup on, and I want you to do in the morning, I want you to do a little bit, you know, between solar noon, which, you know, is different in different latitudes. And then I, I generally, like this time, right now, this time of the year, since it's early April, I mean, even though it's a little bit cloudy here in New Orleans, this is, this is red light city. And just so everybody knows, because we didn't talk about this, maybe we'll end the podcast with this. Why is red light so incredibly important? Well, here's the key. We have these cytochromes, okay, that move from, from one end to the other. That's called your redox potential in your mitochondria. Where electrons fit in from food is cytochrome one. It's called, got an NADH and NAD couple. Mm -hmm. Here's the mm -hmm. issue. Cytochrome two is where fat electrons come in. Cytochrome three is where the Q cycle is. Cytochrome four, which is what I wanna teach you about red light, Guess what? It's got four heme proteins that are red light chromophores. So guess what is important? The more red light you get, and this is the reason why red light is critical, it is the largest part of the mosaic of sunlight. It's 42% of the total amount of sunlight you get. Cytochrome 4 has four red light chromophores. Guess what cytochrome 4 controls, Jodell? Apoptosis. Ah, you just blew my mind. So guess a what? <laughs> and what's the fifth side of chrome, which we already talked about? The ATPase. It turns out the ATPase is also a red light chromophore. The more red light you get, the faster your ATPA spins, even when you're not eating food. Mm -hmm. And there's a paper in Nature from a couple years ago that's about the ATPase being a quantum nano torque rotor engine that's exactly what it is the faster it spins the longer you live the better you do that's the reason why all cause mortality goes down yeah. across the board when you get a lot of sun yes and okay so i have to i have to say this because this is something else you just have to talk to before we talk about before we go because this one's huge too is like how blue light makes you eat more it requires you to have more energy coming in from food versus if you spend all your time out in the sun you actually don't need as many as much nutrition because you're getting what you were talking about i'm assuming is that photosynthesis in your skin right Right. It's an animal version of photosynthesis, but what blue light does is a little bit more complex, but the key thing that it starts with, let's start with the end result before we get to the whole process of how it happens. Basically, blue light destroys autophagy. Mm -hmm. So once you destroy autophagy, what did I say to you when a coupled system? Apoptosis is going to go. Mm -hmm. So that means that every mitochondrial disease is affected by blue light toxicity. What happens when you get blue light from a device? And we didn't get into this, so it's a little bit complex. When the sun rises in the morning, I told you that the amount of red and blue is always balanced. Well, blue light is measured by something called color temperature. So the color temperature in the morning is about 1,600 Kelvin, yeah. okay? The color temperature at noon is 5,750. The color temperature of light right now, because it's about 30 or quarter to six, is 16,000 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Your body is paying attention to that. So the more that number goes up, the more reactive oxygen species, free radicals you're making in your body, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's the key. Every tech device you have that has a blue light screen constantly emits at 5750. So what's the signal you get in your brain? It's solar noon all the time. So every time you look at your phone, no matter what time it is, 
You just told your brain it's new. Mm. That is how you cause chaos. That is how you completely break autophagy, mm. okay? When autophagy is broken, it leads to so many different diseases. One of the ones you said is obesity. So I'm gonna focus in on that one, but I'm not gonna get into the rest because it's way too complex. <clears throat> what happens, the clock mechanism in your eye pays attention to blue light. We have this opsin in our body called melanopsin. It's mm. present in our eye and our skin. I made the predict 10 years ago that I believed it was in our skin and our fat. There was no proof that I was right. The reason why I came up with that is because in my own hacks, I saw there was a huge effect. So circa 2017, nature, guess what they found? Melanopsins in the skin and the fat. So what does melanopsin do? It pays attention to that color temperature change. It's looking for 1600 Kelvin, and then it falls off a cliff. Mm. That's what that photoreceptor links to. Every single opsin in your body is tied to vitamin A. So when it goes awry, vitamin A goes awry. When vitamin A goes awry, vitamin D goes awry because they're a couple yep. system. But the big effect in the eye is you have more DHA, which is fish oil from fish, in the retina to the hypothalamus where the pituitary and the, the leptin receptor is. It has more DHA in it than any other part of the brain. Why? Because when DHA is put into the eye, it becomes more like a wire that has electrons on it. Mm. So it, it functions just copper wire in the body. When you put blue light in it, you reduce the amount of DHA in that central retinal mm. pathway. Whose effect controls this? For the skeptics that don't believe this, a guy named Dr. Nicholas Fazan, who's an ophthalmologic researcher at LSU, that uh, there's two loops in the eye. One's called the short loop, the other one's called the long loop. The short loop comes directly from the retina, recycling. Guess what controls that? Melanopsin. Uh, <laughs> the backup system that we use when this one gets awry is the one in the liver. But if you happen to have obesity, you can't use your liver to fix the problem. The only way to do it is to use AM and PM sunlight, okay? So as DHA goes down, the clock mechanism in your supracosmic nucleus that controls every part of circadian biology and the peripheral genes everywhere in your body can't tell time. So that that clock works on something called an, op, an optical lattice clock mechanism. It pays attention to blue light and blue light in particular. And when you keep looking at your phones or doing this, you have completely screwed the timing mechanism up. So what happens? What happens is what would happen, say, in Home Depot. I'm going to give people another analogy to know. When you're at Home Depot and you're the guy who's in the factory and arrivals come on Tuesday and deliveries go out on Wednesday, your life is nice and easy. But what happens when arrivals and deliveries come on Tuesday? Chaos. At the same time, exactly. <laughs> that's what it does to every cell in your body. Now, what is, let's go to the nonlinear. How is blue light nonlinear? Small little change, okay, I just looked at my cell phone, you don't think that's a big deal. Now what just happened in your mitochondria? Those cytochrome proteins we just talked about, they're supposed to be about one angstrom apart. Now they're four angstroms apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. When that happens at the nano level, the amount of energy and information that can be harnessed from that electron or proton reduces by a factor of 10 for every angstrom it stretches. So if you stretch that out and energy flow drops that, that much, you have to eat more electrons to get it to flow from cytochrome 1 to oxygen. That's why you get to be a fat ass. Mm. That's I think that's a perfect place to end the podcast on because you've just you've just touched on a huge amount in in like that was like a one and a half minute segment that you just touched on a huge amount. So if people can't get something out of that, then they're just not listening or they're too they're too blue lit. <laughs> so I don't want to kill well, any more. I don't want to. I just Sorry. want people to understand there's more to the story than just carbohydrates, right. proteins, and fat. Thank and if you. you heard anything in this podcast that at least intrigues you. This is what your your homework is from this podcast. Do yourself a favor and and just keep your mind open and try to learn something new. Question everything. Because when Question you learn everything. something new and do it, even if you only do one or two things from this podcast, then you still helped yourself. Why? Because here's the flip side of what 
What's important about mitochondria? When you, you've changed the key factors in your life, that means you can make the nonlinear effect work for you in your mitochondria. You can actually reverse illnesses really easy, doing things that most of your friends will say, there's no way that that could work. Well, guess what? There is a way because they don't understand the essence of what nonlinear really means. And hopefully, after listening to this hour and a half or two hour, however how long we've been on this thing, oh, talk yeah. about it, you'll, you'll get it. That's the key. That, and if, if one person gets helped by listening to this, then it was worth it. That's what I feel too. So on that note, Dr. Cruz, I so very much appreciate your time and your expertise and gosh, just what you've done with your life to like bring all of this to fruition because I wouldn't have found this if I hadn't stumbled upon your blog and about upon all of your research and stuff like that. So I highly encourage people to check out jackcruz.com. That's K-R-U-S-E, correct? And how else yeah. can they find you? I know you're on Facebook as well. Yeah, I would say my doctor Facebook page is where I actually do, uh, I probably give about four to six lessons per day in posts. They're designed to really stimulate your curiosity. But if you want to read, uh, especially my current stuff, my old stuff is on at the Jack Cruz mm -hmm. blog site. All good. Uh, but all my new stuff, like the last year, is now on Patreon. Yes. Uh, you're, if, you, if you think anything you heard today, you're going to have to pay me a cup of coffee a month to listen to the wisdom. <laughs> I do it. <laughs> uh, and I would say, you know, the, the Patreon site, I think, is where you'll get a lot more detailed answers because it's private, it's off. And I still do a lot of answering questions on the form on my website. But those are the best ways. And if you want to cut through the first three years of my blog, you can buy the book I wrote five years ago called The Epi Paleo RX. Mm -hmm. It's on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the easiest way to cut through the first three years of the blog because if you go read the public blogs, they will split your head open. It's also it's also on it's awesome. ebook, which is how I got it, which I wish I would have it in real form now because I've highlighted so much of this and at least when I'm on it, I'm on airplane mode, but I wish I had it in like book print too. Because, but it's it's been read over and over again. It's an excellent read, excellent. They, they make it print on demand, so you can get the book. Okay, good. Okay, but I still I turn mean, it on I, airplane I, mode I, and I put my blue blockers on and I just go back through it. I use it as a resource. I mean, I just always go back and find new information, even though I've read it like four times. So <laughs> I appreciate that about it. Um, I won't make us end any more of our autophagy that's going on or and just hurt our mitochondria anymore. But I hope we can do this again because I want, again, to talk more about DHA because I love to talk about that. I want to talk more about the sun, more about cold thermogenesis, which we didn't get to talk about, which is huge. And so well, I hope that you'll pleasure me by coming back on the podcast again in the future. We'll, we'll try to make that happen. Okay, great. Well, enjoy your Friday night, right. and thank you so much once again. Right. I so appreciate you. Okay, take care. <laughs> okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.